Well, we've done I Know What You Did Last Summer. I still know what you did last summer. I wasn't even going to bother with the third one because of how bad I heard it was. I guess kind of like Crow Wicked Prayer, but I eventually did that one. So I watched this. Wow. Let's review I Will Always Know What You Did Last Summer, which is a horrible title, by the way. That's what they came up with? I Will Always Know What You Did Last Summer stars Brooke Nevin, Tori DeVito, Ben Easter, and is directed by Sylvain White. What is up, guys? It's time to review a bad movie, but I'm going to be fair. I'm going to be very fair. Uh, there's a few reasons why this movie's um, kind of bad. Okay. No, it's really bad. But uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting movie to discuss, for sure, as most bad movies are, because it, especially if it's uh, in a sequel run, uh, and there's a sharp drop from the last movie because I still know what you did last summer is a really good movie. It's decent. But even from like a production standpoint, the first two movies are at a certain level production wise. This is a sharp nosedive drop in a 1973 tow truck down to the bottom of a ravine. I don't know where that came from, but that's that's what I get. But first off, let's give you a quick plot synopsis. You got this group of friends, Amber, Colby. Uh, Lance, who's kind of like a, a bystander, he's caught in the middle of it, okay? The, the plot's really stupid. There's this uh, prank that happens at the beginning of the movie. And at first, when I was watching it, you, you got this uh, like red cloth, vertical cloth, and the, the hook killer just comes straight through there. And, and right away, I'm like, oh my God, is this is this real? Is this guy like just chasing them out in the, out in the public at this carnival? But quickly, we find out that this was a prank, the dumbest freaking prank I've ever seen in my life. Like... The, the, the kid jumps off of a building. This is at the beginning of the movie. And there's supposed to be some mattresses there. But while all this is going on, there's not like somebody up there just, just I want to make sure that these mattresses are still there. Okay, okay we're good. Yeah, go ahead and jump. It's because he jumps and there's no mattresses and he fucking dies. Right away, you're like, that's the prank you came up with. And so then the rest of the movie, there is this hook killer. Uh, I think this takes place a year later. And he's going around killing, you know, much like the first two movies, which that's that's fine. It's the reveal at the end, which we will talk about, that is the, oh my God. We, we jump into new territory with this, this sequel, okay? Let's just say that. Now, first off, jumping into the backstory of this, why this movie turned out the way it did was because, full credit to director Sylvain White, who had to come in and pretty much prep everything, the locations, uh, the actors, because there was a director that was going to do this movie. And it was going to be a direct sequel to the last movie. And they were going to have Jennifer Love Hewitt in there and everything. But time went by and they couldn't make it happen. But but they brought this director in and he was fired. And this does happen sometimes. And so after he was fired, Sylvain White came in and had to pretty much do a rush job. Because, you know, when you make movies in Hollywood, the clock is ticking, you're given a timeline. You're always behind schedule, you know, especially in a situation like this. So I think that's one reason why the like the the acting and the dialogue it's almost like they had a script that had one pass and the actors were given one chance to to deliver the line and let's move on. That's what it feels like. You know, a lot of the acting feels kind of subpar in this uh and the production feels way lower than the previous two movies uh, you know this feels like we're steeped knee deep in b-level horror territory and you know i've often wondered because there's a difference between independent horror and just b-level horror movies because there are some great independent horror movies out there that were filmed with a, a lesser budget but i think the difference is those movies are passion projects independent films and you know some of these movies take years to make because it's 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 a group of people usually one person's vision and you got all the time in the world to keep pressing so that way you can get your your movie out whereas b-level horror movies especially in a, a sequel run like this like in a franchise there's no passion behind the project you want to get a sequel out you have a name you have a brand already in place oh let's make another i know what you did last summer movie okay do you care no i don't give a shit Let's just make it because just the name alone is going to get us money. And so that's what they did. But it was so bad that it went direct to video. I don't even think this movie went to theaters. And by the way, guys, there's really nothing uh, memorable 
in a good way about this movie. In a bad way, yes, especially the reveal at the end, which we'll get to. But like there's this one scene where this character Colby, I think it's Colby, yeah, it's Colby, and he, he, he's in the pool, and there's gonna be like a, a death there. But all the, the hook guy does is just like gets him in the, his uh, Achilles heel, and then he gets away. And so he's like limping for the rest of the movie until eventually he dies anyway. So stuff like that is just like a big time head scratcher. The music in this movie, it's going to be bands that you've never heard before. Uh, these bands could have been friends of the production because you got no money whatsoever to license any legit great music. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to knock the bands that are in the movie. They literally do have a band in the movie, too. Uh, you know, uh, the, the characters are a band. They're, I don't know if they're an actual band. I don't think they are. This character, Zoe, there's a lot of padding in this movie with that character and her band. The first time we uh, meet her, I think, she's having practice, but she's dressed like she's playing Madison Square Garden. Like, who dresses like that when they're actually having practice? You know, you would more than likely be in just like a t-shirt and maybe some ripped jeans or something like that. But no, she's dressed to the nines. It's like attention to detail that sometimes we, we just don't pay attention to. Now, to give it credit, though, there are a couple of cool shots along the way. There is a scene where they're in this like warehouse or factory and there's like a reveal of the killer where the camera kind of pans up if it was something cool like that i was gonna acknowledge it and and i was like yeah that, that was a cool nice cool shot and it, it's kind of disheartening because you think damn i wish they would have had you know more days like that on the set because you could tell there was some creativity flowing on that day for the most part it doesn't seem like there was that much care into the final product you know, it just maybe it was a happy accident that they had a cool shot like that. Don Shanks actually plays the, the killer from Halloween 5. Um, and he does have like a cameo in the Amulets at the end of the movie. I'll definitely give Brooke Nevin some credit as the final girl in the movie. The final act is definitely the best part of this movie until it goes off a cliff with the killer reveal. Um, but I thought she was a capable final girl. And I really can't fault any of the actors because I feel like they weren't given... A chance to really dig deep into their roles you know I could be wrong but that's the gist that I get a lot of the performances feel kind of like one note one dimensional and I just felt like the clock was ticking you know and they were like hey, just get to get the take and let's keep moving but I liked her performance as Amber uh, and the final act she is she's pretty good in that part too you know I can really compare this movie to the crow salvation um, I think the crow salvation is a better movie but it felt more like a, a, a like a made-for-TV movie compared to the previous two Crow movies. Um, and as much shit as people give the Crow City of Angels, I think there's some some heavy creativity, especially in the like the set design of that movie. And it's it's garnered uh, a cult following along the way too. And I actually like the Crow City of Angels. But Salvation again, uh, there's some good ideas there. You got some great music in the soundtrack too, but. It, it, for the most part, it feels a little bit too theatric in a made-for-TV type setting. I can kind of compare that to this. This feels like that. It feels like the production was uh, quite a step down from the previous two movies. So now let's jump into uh, that disastrous uh, reveal where the, we're going full-blown, and by the way, spoilers ahead, okay? Five, four, three, two, one. We're going full blown into like the supernatural world because along the way, I'm it, it's set up kind of like a whodunit, and I'm thinking, is the killer gonna be like Ben the fisherman from the first two movies? They don't really allude to that, um, or is it gonna be just a whodunit? And it could be you know one of the main characters, but no, it's a fucking zombie. It's a it's a fisherman zombie. He has like a, a zombie face. I guess he's supposed to be like the spirit of Ben. Like how in the hell did this happen? There's no like setup, like build along the way uh, to even allude that there is going to be this supernatural entity, you know? So when it happens, it's like the biggest what the fuck moment I think I've ever seen in a killer reveal. It's, it's, it's wow. It threw me for a loop. It really did. It's hilarious, actually. I kind of busted out gut laughing. So in the end, I'm going to give it a two hours lost, you know, uh, I'll be fair. I, I did find some entertainment. I was definitely laughing at the movie. Sometimes you can laugh at a bad movie and that can be a form of entertainment. It just is. Part of it was kind of shocked. Like what the, what the hell am I watching? And this is one of those movies. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say they liked. I will always know what you did last summer, you know? And if you do like this movie, that's great. That's great. 
I, I will say, I guess it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be because I thought it was going to be like completely horrible. But I guess there was some entertainment value, but really none of the kills are great at all. Actually, I'm going to be fair. I'm going to take that back. There is one kill that I think was pretty cool. I, it's the forklift kill where the killer picks up the character and he pushes him onto the forklift. And, the you know, I, I can drive a forklift. I've driven many a forklift. That forklift leg goes right through the guy's body. And I thought that was pretty cool. I did like that. But then they kind of screw it up because the killer, there's one scene where his head like comes up like a turtle. I guess that's how the reveal went. His head literally came up. So through the whole movie, he's keeping his head like pushed down like that. And then when he reveals himself, his head just comes straight up like a turtle. I guess you could call that a hashtag turtle reveal. But yeah, two hours lost. Uh, guys, let me know what your thoughts on I Will Always Know What You Did Last Summer. I will never watch this movie again. Also, be sure to come over to Kill Flicks where we talk horror all day and every day. And on Fridays, we do free for all Fridays. Follow my drum drums on my socials. Support me on Patreon. Buy me a coffee. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a good day. Rum out.